Greetings to everybody that is tuned in for this week's Teacher Talk. It's uh, such an honor to be able to connect with everyone that will be watching today and for those of you that might be watching this when it's archived on YouTube. I am so excited to have a new colleague with us this week to be talking about the success that comes from possibilities and seeing possibilities as success as we're all navigating these unique times. Um, and Nathan, I am fascinated with your last name and I want you to pronounce it for me because otherwise I think I'll butcher it because of this unique uh, O with the slash. So how do I pronounce your last name? It, it's the, the O is for all the Norwegians who are leaving Trondheim and they couldn't figure <laughs> out who pronounced the O which way. And so in the Tronsk dialect, they added the slash so that you know it was an O and not an O. So it, it's just a regular old O, but it has the slash. But it's so, pronounced Rodal, like I oh got my car and rode all the way home. Nice. But Rodal. Ro, not on doll. And I'm so glad you explained that. I am uh, have a ton of uh, Norwegian heritage through my grandfather, um, and I didn't realize that. So that's that's the designated as an O. So just wrote all. And in Swedish, they use the umlaut. Yeah, that's genius. In Danish, it's it's uh, it goes back and forth with all the Hanseatic history they have. And it's good to know in the Pacific Northwest because we have lots of Scandinavians up here. Oh, no shortage. Well, um, so it is a pleasure to welcome Nathan Rodal, and I uh, i probably should have figured that out before we went live, but I'm glad that <laughs> we have all been educated in some uh, Norwegian letters and uh, pronunciation. So uh, it's fantastic to have you with us. I'm going to have you introduce yourself in just a little bit for people that might be tuning in outside of Washington or might not know where you're currently serving. I had the privilege of connecting with Nathan originally through the Washington Music Educators Association, and I am so excited to be working on him through some state initiatives through WMEA and learning more about his program and what he's doing in the state. But I think it's great to connect with colleagues that can sort of commiserate and, and share in solidarity the challenges that we're all facing and something that has come up uh, not only through what WMEA is promoting in the state but also people that have been talking about all over the world that are involved in art education is just seeking new possibilities of making art and connecting with people and today I wanted to start the conversation in this place where we look at possibilities as an avenue for success that just trying something is showing the success that you're having because you're staying connected you're making art you're making music in our case um, so i wanted to to explore that but then of course like we do in all of our teacher talks allow the conversation to mature wherever it needs to with important topics and and things that we need to be considering uh, for those that might be watching for the first time teacher talks started as an, uh, just a way for me to stay connected to my own students i'm christopher hansen i serve as the director of music education and orchestral activities at seattle pacific university teacher talks are sponsored by a student organization that I have the opportunity to work with called Feathers. That's Future Educators in the Arts Transforming Human Experience and Realities. When we shut down uh, last March and transitioned to fully online learning, I wanted to stay connected with my music education majors in particular. And so we created this sort of weekly podcast. We are now on our 23rd episode. And so it has gone on longer than I thought it would, but it's created some incredible opportunities to connect with musicians and educators, and people that are in administrative roles uh, in nonprofit organizations and public schools all over the world and helped me personally gain some really important perspective on how everybody is navigating this global pandemic, the social justice issues that have come to the fore recently, particularly in America. And so this has just been a, a really amazing platform. I feel so blessed to utilize technology to connect with people and discuss these things. I want to make sure, especially those that are watching for the first time, that teacher talks are not necessarily about providing uh, answers or solutions to you know definitive problems, but kind of the opposite. It's about sharing ideas and solutions to unique problems that some of us are facing or answers to unique questions that some of us have posed. And through that, I hope that we can mature and nurture a dialogue amongst colleagues that will you know, benefit you or others. So I don't want anyone to assume that things that are suggested or talked about here are necessarily going to work everywhere. Again, it's, it's not about finding the silver bullet to our problems, but it is about discussing some of the challenges that we're facing. And through that dialogue, I think we can find these possibilities that, that mature into the success that we're having in different areas. I also think it's great to just connect with colleagues and celebrate some of the things that they're doing. 
uh, everyone has become wildly innovative and are doing such extraordinary things. They may or may not work for you, but I think it's always good to reach out to people and say, hey, I see what you're doing and I think it's amazing and I respect it and honor it as an opportunity to stay connected and continue to make music with our students and with our colleagues. So uh, Seattle Pacific University is a Christian institution, and I do like to start with just a brief moment of prayer and reflection. Whatever that means for you, for those that are watching, I just encourage you to take this moment to find uh, some solace and to be appreciative of these opportunities that we have, particularly this one, to utilize technology to stay connected. Please join me as you feel comfortable. Lord, thank you for this day, and thank you for the resources that you provide us to continue to serve each other as colleagues and our students and communities through the arts. We are so grateful for the things that you've entrusted us with, and we pray that we are the best stewards that we need to be to define and fulfill your will. Lord, thank you for the things that you continue to work for us in our lives. Help us to grow closer to you through the service that we provide our communities. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Nathan, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, where you're currently working, some of the things you're plugged into. Well, I, I'm currently the high school orchestra teacher here in Port Angeles. Uh, Port Angeles, if, if those of you aren't aware, is sort of an aberration in small town music. Uh, it's a small town of about, I want to say, eight to 10,000, something like that. Could be a little bit bigger. The school has about 800 ish kids this year and there's 200 orchestra students uh, yeah uh and and including um when you include the numbers from the elementary and middle school students we have about a thousand students in the school district um which that's fantastic is, my the last year was my first year in the district and my immediate predecessor james ray has been on the show a couple of times to talk to you now and he, he started a lot of the kids that I teach now. I and never so I made that connection. That is mm -hmm. awesome. So when, when we're talking about, you know, making connections with other educators, and I mean, James is like number one on the list of three people that I call for help when I have a, I've never experienced this, never encountered this situation. <laughs> but now we find ourselves in a no one has encountered this situation. A, a colleague of mine, a, a good buddy that teaches out at Central Valley in Spokane, uh, Mason Flemmer, he says, it's like my second year of first year teaching right now. <laughs> and and, and I, I think that's how it feels for all of us. And when we're, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and go off on a tangent that, yeah, please. you know, I, I'm Nathan, I teach at Port Angeles High School. That's about as, as much as we need to go into right now. Um, but I, I see a lot of um, it, and it's well-intentioned, uh, information and resources and webinars coming out of academia. But a lot of these people haven't taught real students in a real public school setting in over a decade. And if yep. they have, it's like a private school thing. And really the orchestra is kind of their own show and they can do whatever they want to do. And this is not a time where we can beg forgiveness and just do what we whatever it is we want to do we really have to like stay inside the lines and follow the rules and so every time i go to one of these webinars and this you know the doctor of whatever has this great idea that um, that could be applied really well in uh an an academic situation or even when when we someday get back to normal that would be really really helpful mm -hmm. um but depending on what your school district has decided about the way you engage with students, uh, the information in these webinars is like totally mute and, and unnecessary. And the one thing that I, I've, I really need help with, I think we all need help with, and is the one thing that for sure, no matter what your school district situation is that we need to focus on, is how to make contact with a student, whatever your restrictions may be, and and help them to continue to identify as an orchestra student. Yeah. How do we do that? Because rehearsal, I, I don't know what that's going to look like. I have no good answers right now. I have asked permission to get, you know, can I have four kids in the auditorium with me out in the audience, because technically the audience is a separate room, so that's still one under the maximum if you wanted to add a bass player. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and we could rehearse. Maybe I have five groups to meet a week and maybe everybody out of all of my kids gets to meet once a month. Yeah. Uh, which is not ideal, but it's better than nothing. I mean, that's just, that's the best idea I've got right now with the restrictions on top of me. Um, and we, we talk a lot about the silver lining of the situations that we can focus on the deep work, the individual technique of each student. Uh, you know, this might be your first opportunity to dive into three octave scales. Uh, we, you and I had talked earlier about putting together a list of uh, teachers and, and professionals who'd be willing to do uh, like either one-on-one or group lessons with students. Because I'm a violinist and I can certainly use a cello in a passable way, but I'm not a professional cellist. And yeah. when it comes to, you know, there's a situation where maybe this would be more comfortable in a different position or, you know, things like uh, where you're doing a pivot rather than a shift that, you know, as a non cellist, I'm not the authority on that. So having somebody come in who, who is an authority on, on that uh, instrument could be really helpful beyond just me meeting with my students. But that comes back to what, what is, what are, what is the straight jacket that your school district has put you in? For the for the best of reasons, I mean, they have all these risk management people. Exactly. Who, yeah. Who are telling them what they're able to do, and then you have county officials from your your local government telling you what you're allowed to do. Uh, so this this is no one person's fault. I, I don't want to appear negative towards you know any in administrator or administration or school district. That's you know we're just playing the hand we're dealt. Um, but in 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 the worst case scenario, or not worst case scenario, uh, but if I can't get those teachers to come in, if that's not approved, then it, it'll be me uh, and meeting one-on-one with those kids. But what I worry about is in class, when we do the technique stuff, when you pull out the the Chris Selby, you know, su- habits of a successful orchestra musician, uh, the, the kids don't super enjoy doing that work. It's you know, tedious. In, in yeah. class. And so if that's the only kind of work that we're planning on doing, uh, how are we going to keep these kids excited? Uh, I, I have long held a, f- a philosophy, and it's not something that I learned uh, in the world of education. It's something that I learned playing in community orchestras, uh, because uh, teachers, as teachers, we need clock hours to keep our certification. And a great way to do that, if you're a music teacher, is to be part of a, a community group, either you know a community choir or a community orchestra or a community band, and um, I've played under a lot of different directors with a lot of different philosophies. And at the end of the day, I think you need to accept that there's only so many people who are actually going to practice at home. I mean, in this with adults, uh, there's only so many people who are actually going to really seriously pull out the music, turn on the metronome and, and, and practice because none of us are being paid to be at one of those community orchestra situations. I mean, every now and again, there's a principal player who is, that's sort of a, a one-off situation, but the, what, what's at the core, what's the reason those people have come together to make music. And, and the only answer I can come up with is that they love to make music together. And so when you're in a rehearsal with a director, who's like picking apart like this, like the evenness of a triplet in the clarinet, one clarinet player not only does that one player now feel really like isolated and called out uh, but you have maybe a hundred people sitting there doing nothing that aren't getting paid that have taken time some of them you know driving quite a long distance to play with this orchestra who, who aren't doing anything and so in the classroom it's my philosophy that we unpack and we play the whole time everybody plays and when there's a like a cello thing that's it's in tenor clef and it's uncomfortable and it's awkward and um, traditionally we would just deal with the cello section and let's get that fingering down. I'll do the work outside of class to make transpose that part so that everybody can look at it, and then we all solve it together. And I think we're gonna have to find a way to solve those problems together without getting too tedious. Because as soon as we just go 100% into music theory and three octave scales, I think we're going to lose a majority of those students who are there because that's the one class that they've had with their best friend since fourth grade. 
because yeah. we're all in different math classes now, or we had to take different periods of the same English class. Uh, and that human connection is what kept them invested in orchestra. And I don't see a, a ton of great answers right now for how to keep the students uh, not just engaged, but self-identifying as an orchestra student and, and drawing uh, security in themselves from that identity uh, in, in the formats that we're proposing. Uh, and I want you, you've talked to more people about this than I have. I, I wonder what uh, is bopping around in your brain when I'm talking about this. You, you're hitting on so many amazing things and I'm glad you're bringing them up because I have to, I want to tread lightly because I never want someone to assume that my experiences or observations and the things that I share are meant to be a uh, sort of condemnation of their own work or judgment towards the things that they're trying. Uh, but I, you know, all of that being said, uh, you know, I, I use that preface as a way of saying I do see issues with the system in, in which we educate educators and we prepare music educators. And it is frustrating to say the least. Um, I want to work backwards from what you were talking about. So first and foremost, something that I do appreciate, whether we want to phrase it as seeing a silver lining, but something that I think is work that needs to be done is revisiting our philosophy of teaching music in public mm -hmm. schools. And why are we doing it? And yeah. if, you know, I was actually just talking to my partner about this yesterday, that I've talked to a few colleagues that have appropriately been frustrated because the way in which they were taught to teach, the way in which they have led their programs was completely based on performance and festivals and competition and concerts. And so now that that's been taken away, they really don't know what to do. And they have lamented uh, either through social media or through you know private conversations of like, well, I just don't know what to do. And I've tried to be careful because I'm having similar struggles in my own right. I'm, a, I'm still an orchestra conductor at the collegiate level at a you know small liberal arts school. So it's very attuned to the, the skill set of a high school orchestra. I'm working with a lot of non-music majors. So I'm programming a lot of the same music and dealing with that same sort of, you know, the, the students at high school are not necessarily um, seeking a degree in music or seeking uh, further advancement in music after high school. So you're getting people with varied interests, with varied levels of ability and investment in your ensemble to make music together. So I, I really do liken a lot of what I'm doing at SPU to still working with sort of an advanced high school ensemble. It's that same level of engagement. And that's not pejorative. That's not a judgment, right? That's an observation. I'm so glad you said this because the... I've had this conversation with, with multiple people, and, and I'm, I'm not afraid to say it, that there are a lot of t uh, conductors out there of, of bands and orchestras and choirs who are so obsessed with the competitive aspect yeah. of music. And in the annals of history, when it's all over and, and you're, you're nothing but bones and dust, nobody is going to care that you were the best junior high band director. It doesn't matter. Like, the impact yeah. on... But if you were a really compassionate educator that really focused on, on making a connection with each child in whatever way that that opening was for them, I mean, you're going to get the kids who do want to go on and have some kind of career in music. Um, and, and just their own ambition of being that kind of person, they're going to get that, whether it's from you or not. Uh, but the 80 or 90 percent of the rest of the kids who are there just because their friend is or because they liked orchestra in fourth grade and now they've been doing orchestra since fourth grade. Uh, and it's our job to kind of nurture that relationship and orchestra or music is just the medium. But the, the really yeah. powerful opportunity we have is to train young minds to be good people. That's what we're really teaching. Music is kind of the side gig here. I mean, the music well, is the medium through which we train young minds. I think the real challenge is, and this is what I get at, you know, you have to contextualize the ensembles that you're working with, or it, it, to translate that into broader terms, you have to understand your classroom. You mm -hmm. know, who are the students that you're serving? And I say that because I do believe that teachers are, are public servants. And I think we need to be more connected to our community. So I'm bringing all of this up to get to one of the original points that you made, that when we're looking at 
the music teacher preparation programs, when we're looking at the education that we give future educators, there really is a disconnect. I don't get frustrated with educators that I meet that are completely focused on competition and performance and travel because that didn't come out of thin air. You came from an education that taught you that these were the things that were important, significant, whether that was an education that you received at a university or it was an education you received through your student teaching experience or internship, or it was something that you experienced, the education you received when you were in secondary school and plugged into your music ensemble. At some point in your life, someone taught you that this is what makes success in a music classroom. These mm -hmm. are the things. And we so quickly detach ourselves in general, from, from my observations, mm -hmm. we detach ourselves from being educators of human beings, and we, we start to build this ivory tower on our campus of, well, I'm the band director, the choir director, the orchestra director, the theater instructor, the dance instructor. I've challenged a lot of colleagues with this. You know, when someone asks you, what do you do, is your response, well, I'm the orchestra director. Are you immediately segregating yourself by subject? Or do you say, well, I'm a public school teacher. Can you wear that badge with pride? Mm -hmm. And I'll steal a quote from Bob Phillips, who's, you know, an incredible pedagogue. You teach pedagogue. the child in front of you? Is that the teach quote? The, yeah, teach the child in front of you. And I've, I've stolen that from him and modified it to an extent to say, teach the human being in front of you. Yes. And, you know, Bob always pushes. He He created that sort of catchphrase to say, you're not teaching the students that you want in five years as you're building your program. You're not teaching those incredible students you had two years ago that you lament graduated. You're teaching the people right where they are in front of you. And, uh, you know, Henry Wong and all of these great educational philosophers and pedagogues have told us it's about meeting students where they are. It's about starting where your students are and everything that we see in in sort of popular educational uh, professional development and the new pedagogy that's being promoted is talking about growth. It's about tracking growth and trying to appreciate this is where we started and this is where we end up. And that affects how you do assessment. That affects how you, you do instruction. That affects your classroom management. So if we peel back the layers and, and again, one of your original points of, a lot of the the university professors that we look at that are teaching future teachers haven't been in the high school or middle school or elementary school classroom in over a decade, and those classrooms are wildly different. Yes. The higher ed in general is completely consumed with pedagogy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the, the problem, if, if we're identifying it as a problem, because again, I don't want what I'm saying well, to sound and, condemning. And, and contextually relevant. Yeah. I mean, the, the, like, the, uh, the these textbooks we're referring to, and, and and we could list names, and we could list other books, but it the, the teaching that pedagogy to uh, aspiring teachers is, is important from the context of this, like how scope and sequence works, mm -hmm. and and how you should structure a, a unit of study, and you know, don't just show up and rehearse, you know, actually have a plan. What are your goals and how are you going to achieve them and how are you going to measure them? These are important things, but it, it, it's sort of like uh, getting ready for the Olympics or something and you get out on the diving board and all of the advice that everybody's been giving you, you can't remember. Like that's what it's like to be in the, in the classroom for the first time without your mentor teacher there is, you know, all of these books that I read and cut, like they don't matter anymore because I've got a kid who's screaming at me about, I don't know. And I've got two girls over here fighting and I've got this other group of kids that just kind of want to play some music. And I've got to find a way to get, put out all these fires at the same time and then maybe get to some music, which is what I was taught to do in college. And to some extent I was taught to, you know, deescalate situations and, and know what to expect from, you know, intense behaviors from students. Uh, but I, I, I openly say that my junior and senior year of college would be, have been just as effectively served full-time student teaching. I would have learned much more that way. Well, 
Yeah, and the, I think the biggest issue is, and this is how how academia works and just sort of Western culture, is that we want to specialize. We want to segregate ourselves into disciplines. And therein lies the problem. I tell all of my music ed majors, um, who can attest to this, for those of them that are watching, I tell every freshman that comes in, you have to know that you are a double major. You are a music major and you are an education major. Mm -hmm. You are seeking two different degrees and different disciplines that we have to marry. And mm -hmm. I think that becomes the problem is that being a music major, you learn music history, you learn music theory, you start to learn, depending on your discipline and usually music mm -hmm. ed, you learn pedagogy. And that's where we, we get mis misunderstandings from my perspective more often than not, is that what we teach music education majors is music pedagogy, how to teach music. And some of those things are arguably universal. Um, mm -hmm. If you're going to do rote versus note, right? Like there's room for debate, but you can talk about that uh, in string pedagogy. You know, are you going to start your curriculum pizzicato or are you immediately going to start with the bow? Are you going to yeah, utilize and, the fourth finger right away or not? Bob Phillips thing of you teach the student in front of you. Uh, the, I, I'm involved in the, the uh, National Association for Music Educators. There's a, an orchestra council. Mm -hmm. uh, and Beth Fortune, who teaches in, in Ballard, invited me to be on this council. And one of our other members, her name is Sarah Goulish. She teaches somewhere in Pennsylvania, I believe. Right. And, and she is someone who was not a string player originally and, and was uh, brought into a, a strings situation in, uh, I, I, I believe, a predominantly black community. And the Western model of preparing string music was not working for her. And so she developed this whole other thing where the kids are kind of composing their own music yeah. and the performance doesn't look like we sit in this arch situation with a conductor waving a baton uh, because you, you have to meet the student where they are and teach the person in front of you. And if the Western model of we, you know, I stand on the podium, you sit in that chair and we're going to go through Ina Kleina and, I'm going to teach you how to shift to third position because that's how my teacher taught me. And uh, when we were doing this solo that we play this measure on the D string because that's how my teacher did it, is examining whether or not that still serves us. It doesn't mean that, and I think we're both trying to say this, that um, the, the approach of academia is not invalid. There's, there, no. there, contextually, it's very important. Uh, but there are, are times when we need to ask ourselves, is this still working? Well, and see, that's I think there's there's a place where we diverge in that because my issue is the compartmentalization of these mm -hmm. skills. Mm -hmm. We, in general, at most universities, we have people student teaching for you know one semester or one quarter or one year. We have this finite amount of time that you're out in the schools observing professionals. And it, it frustrates me in that we need to invest more time, both in the literature and the curriculum of these music education courses, of teaching people how to be educators mm -hmm. that happen to be teaching music. Mm -hmm. We need to focus more on some of the things that you brought up, the classroom manage management strategy, how to build curriculum, how to do lesson planning. I felt... You know, I felt in, in my own story, because I feel like I can speak to that in the truest sense, I was what is identified in the state of Texas as a non-traditional educator, and meaning I did not complete my student teaching or do my certification when I was in college. I got to my senior year as an undergrad and realized that teaching in public school was really difficult. I didn't want to do it. I was turned off by it because I was working in after-school programs and community music programs. And I was like, I don't know how public school teachers do it. I don't want that job. It's too hard. And I shied away from it. And I had been a music ed major for four years, and I decided to leave with a degree in composition. So then I went to grad school and was still working with community music programs and after school programs. And I, I went to grad school, got graduate degrees in music, and knew a lot about music pedagogy. I felt very confident again, leading community music programs and teaching music and other avenues. You don't just teach music in public school. You can teach music in lots of different areas. 
But teaching in public school means that you are taking on the mantle and the identity of a public school educator, and that has unique responsibilities. And I, I mourned for many years, especially my first three years of teaching in public school, that I really didn't understand how to be a public school teacher. I knew how to be a music teacher. I understood music pedagogy. I knew how to address those concerns and problems and questions. But when it came to teaching human beings in a classroom environment, in the seven or eight period day, on block scheduling, like all of the things that go with teaching public school, I felt woefully unprepared. Even though I completed a certification process, even though I had the credentials, there was so little time talking about the practical and philosophical implications of you are a public school teacher in this state, in the United States, contextualizing it. What does that mean? And although I've, I'm constantly sort of battling this idea of how significant philosophy needs to be a part of the music ed curriculum, I feel that we need to talk more philosophy because those are where we're making our decisions. And that's what actually guides us in the classroom of, is my philosophy of teaching music in public schools to expose people to, you know, representing and expressing themselves and their realities of the world through music? Do I see music as this avenue to enlighten people and to broaden their perspective of the world? Or is my philosophy producing great performances? Mm -hmm. That is a philosophy of music education. It's not the only philosophy, however, and it becomes a disservice to you in moments like we're living through now, from my perspective, because then when you are confronted with, well, guess what? That opportunity doesn't exist anymore to create that product, to have that assessment. So what's left? Well, and, and I'll back up my, my colleague, James Ray, who, who has frequently told me that if, if you're focusing on, on the students and the to, to some degree, the, the individual needs of each student, which may be emotional, which may be, you know, technical, like this the cello player never learned how to learn tenor clef, and we've got to find a, a delicate way to address the one student in the room. But if you deal with all of the social emotional things and you make a good connection with students and you get the kids excited about music, the the good performances will follow that that can be subsequent of focusing on the individual needs of each, of each student that it, but if you put it the other way around where the uh, reaching this maximum performance is your goal, you're going to miss all of the social emotional learning that, that could have taken place all the while. Oh, absolutely. Um, one of the, in fact, the very first guest that we had on Teacher Talks was uh, Dr. Birch Browning, who I love. He wrote a book, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to find a link that I can put in here. It's an orientation to musical pedagogy. And there's a part of the book that I really appreciate. He talks about sort of this journey that you go through as an educator. And, and looking at educational statistics, you know, that, that fifth year, what a lot of people call the hump, is a defining moment. A staggering majority of teachers do not survive, survive their first five years of teaching. Most of them leave the profession before five years. Three years is a milestone. Five years is the big one. And when I had started teaching, I was really determined to get past my fifth year teaching in public school. And I remember, and, and I was so glad that... Uh, Dr. Browning had articulated this. He talked about those first three years, and I, it's been a while since I read this, so I, I might misconstrue the, the layout of this, but I highly recommend that book. It's the book that we use for our Introduction to Music Ed class. He talks about in those first three years, really as an educator, you're teaching for yourself. And it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but you are exercising all of these skills that you've tried to attain. And so many of the goals that you create are for yourself. You know, mm -hmm. I want to perform this piece. I want to try this book out. I want to get my students to this place. And it's really you trying to figure out how am I most effective? And all of your decisions are really focused on yourself. There is a, a moment at which you transition and you start thinking about the classroom, which I found interesting. And so he says, then it becomes these larger goals that are less focused on yourself, more focused on your program and program development. And, and really when you become this expert teacher, if you will, he doesn't use this language, but ultimately get to the point where you start to focus on your students. And you start to learn how to differentiate and how to serve every single person 
in your classroom with these lulls. And I think that process, which really is a philosophical process, this process of inquiry, this critical reflection into our teaching, is where we fall short more often than not because we get so consumed in what I would consider the minutia. We get so consumed in how can I teach you to shift a thumb position? How can we talk about alternate fingering or articulations into that day to day, the grind, if you will, of this is what we're sort of actively doing in the classroom is teaching these unique skills to get to these end products. And we don't pull it back to say, and I'm going to use your example, you know, we're, we're trying to read tenor cloth in our cello section. Okay. Why are we trying to read tenor clef? Well, because it's in this piece that we programmed. Okay, well, why did you program that piece? <laughs> like, let's talk about that. But that's not the end of the conversation because you might have a really valid reason, but I'm going to intentionally make it somewhat superficial. Well, because I saw this group perform it at conference and it was such a cool piece and I want to be like that programmer, that director. Okay, great. Why do you want to be like that programmer director? Because they got to perform at a conference is that your end goal? No, 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 no. I just think they performed the piece really well and I really like the piece. Okay, well, why do you like the piece? Because it was attractive in public? Is that what was attractive? Like, there should be more substance to it. Well, no, 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 no. Because I looked at the score at the conference and I saw that it would be really challenging and that's why I wanted to do it. So are you just wanting to program music because it's challenging? Why is it challenging? Just because it's technically challenging? Shouldn't there be more to the music that you're programming you're teaching to that? Like, is it just because, well, no, you know, if you could scale it back within a critical conversation of your teaching and say, I have these pursuits of performing this piece that I've been able to contextualize in our curriculum with social relevance and cultural relevance, but I know that we're not going to achieve that piece until my cellos can play in tenor clef and my second violins can play in tune in third position and my first violins can play in fifth position. So what I'm going to do is scaffold. And in the fall, I'm going to program this piece, which is most challenging for the cellist, and I'm going to be able to focus on the cellist, and my other sections are going to be able to do this. And when you can articulate that, that to me is you're educating. You get it. You understand how to build curriculum. You understand how to scaffold. You understand how to create these academic goals, but you're able to tie them into these lofter social, social goals. You know how to work with each of your sections and build success for them. I feel like that is where more often than not, we, and I'm, I'm lumping myself together with my colleagues that are music educators that prepare music teachers, I think that's where we fall short, is we don't connect the dots. We talk about music pedagogy and about program music and about building programs, and at some programs you talk about fundraising and recruiting and retention, and that's all great, but then we just sort of drop to the school of education to talk about scaffolding and differentiation and serving every student and all this and we we created as passe and forgive me for my increase in volume and tempo in my speech you can tell i'm getting a little heated because it really upsets me because i don't feel more often than not and there are absolutely extraordinary exceptions but from my experiences as an industry, as a music education industry in academia, I don't think we're preparing music teachers to be educators. I yeah. think we're preparing them to be music teachers. And, and it no has matter, to be more than that. I have seen uh, the students come out of, of every which school. And uh, I think the the universities here in Washington are, are some of the best around for especially music education in particular. Uh, between Pacific Lutheran University, where, where I graduated, and Central Washington, and Western, and, and certainly SPU as well, uh, are doing a good job of churning out educators who want to go out into the world and make a connect, a real human connection mm -hmm. with students as, as a primary goal. Uh, but to back to your point about the first three years, first five years of teaching, is there are just things that you are only going to experience in the classroom. And if, if we were really having discussion about how do we challenge the way that academia handles training educators, I think we would need to talk about getting uh, uh, music ed students or education students in the classroom more and finding, because it's, it's almost like when we go into the classroom, our, our mentors are trying to hold our hands, but they're getting into an elevator. You know, well, no, actually, I would have. I want to pause you there. One of the issues that I have is we've created an apprenticeship model for teachers. Mm -hmm. To me, that's the issue. Um, I, you know, I made 
I've, I've shared this a couple times on Teacher Talk. One of the reasons that I made the leap from teaching high school to teaching college was I, I wanted to incite change in music education, and I realized it's going to happen where we're training our teachers. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I recognized my own deficiencies as an educator, and I recognized the challenges in the system. We do teach in a system, a public school system. I recognized the deficiencies in the system, and I was tracing it back to my preparation in college. I was mm -hmm. taught to think this way about education. I was taught to view it this way and problem solve this way. So I wanted to be a part of the solution. And for me, the solution resides in how we are training teachers. And so yeah. I've, I made a very conscious decision to make that leap and to go into that area. And in doing so, I became hypercritical of what was going on. And I said, really, I want to hear from my students. I want to know what they think. And I, I reached out in my first year talking to alumni and talking to student teachers and talking to freshmen. And what do you want to see? What do you want to do? And every single one of them said, I want to teach more. And I recognized in building my courses in my first year that I was already perpetuating what it is that I wanted to change. All of my syllabi were this apprenticeship model where I was the expert. I have taught in public school. I know the answers and I'm going to share my experiences and you're going to take notes and you're going to reflect on my experiences and you don't get to teach until you go to student teaching. And I thought, wait a minute. And I, I immediately tried to flip that and it was very eye-opening to me. And forgive me because this is going to sound so judgmental towards my students, but it, it was truly awakening for me. I was teaching a, a woodwind methods course and we were going through it and we had read the book and they were had their instruments and I was teaching them, you know, here are some things that you can do. And me teaching a woodwind methods class is scary enough because I am a violinist and an orchestra director at heart. So I'm going through this class and immediately I thought, why do I keep, I keep saying the same thing. Like they need to do it. They need to be teaching each other. We need a peer instruction model. This is, you know, research shows that this works. So I told one of the students, said, I want you to get up here and you're going to lead this exercise and I want you to offer feedback to the students. And they were mortified because they got up in front of everybody and they went, and they literally, the student looked at me and they said, I don't know what to do. And I realized, you know what? The reason you're in this position is because I have not done my job. I have given you the book that tells you how to teach, that tells you how to do the thing and how to problem solve, but it's words. It's useless until you put it into application. And I'm expecting you to retain this for three years and put it into practice your senior year when you're student teaching. And as you already pointed out, and you get in front of the students and you go blank because you've got all this information without any practical application. And oh. so immediately, and whether we call it, which I think is kind of a cliche and not necessarily used correctly, the flipped classroom, if you will, because people don't really exercise that the way that it was designed. But if you really do say, especially in music teacher preparation programs, we're going to learn this information, and this is the model I've tried to adopt. We spend the first three or four weeks of a quarter getting that content knowledge. You know, Here's the book that has the resources you need. Here's the lived experience. Here are my anecdotes and stories. Let's watch some videos and see what teachers are going through. But halfway through the quarter, I put my students in the front of the classroom. I have told you how you can listen to a young clarinet player and where you can identify some issues, whether there's some leakage or there's not enough air or not enough support or they're fingering incorrectly. Or I've taught you all of that in terms of where to get that information, what it looks like. Now I need you to stand in front of these young clarinet players, hear that, and then execute how can I solve that problem and how can I teach that and approach all it. All the big names in, in, in education, in academia – have identified thoroughly through research and you know double blind studies that learning by doing is the yes. most powerful way to learn. But then the way that we teach educators is just giving them a book and then telling them just verbally the way, and then maybe they write a reflection paper. Um, and I, I'm just to, to speak to this, I, I've got to talk about my my own experience a little bit because there there was a big turning point for me in my student teaching where the classroom was flipped on me, where I I didn't get what I expected based on my experience in academia, which was well-intentioned. And all of my uh, professors at PLU, I think they did uh, their very best to prepare me um, for, for the methods that they sought to apply. Um, but I, I was student teaching with Paula Ferguson, who is the orchestra director at Redmond High School, and sort of sat down my first day and the first class was about to start. And she said, 
Okay, go for it. <laughs> oh, we have a visitor. Uh, so she didn't, she, the, she had picked out the music already and she just kind of said, well, go do your thing. And kind of sat there and watched. And there were a couple of days where it got kind of ugly, where I didn't really know what I would, the same way that a first year teacher would experience being out there on their own with no lifeline. And, you know, she was there. I could see she was there. If, you know, if things really, you know, burned down and people were throwing things, I'm sure she would have helped me. It never got to that point, thankfully. But afterwards, we would have a little debrief, you know, at, at the end of the day. And she would say, hey, in third period, something happened. And I was, yeah, what was that? And she would say, well, what do you think? And she would she would tell me zero answers. Exactly. Zero answers. But she would sit with me until I had sufficiently worked out what I had done or failed to do uh, to to move the ship in the right direction. And then the next day I, I, I would have figured something out. And uh, you, 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 like you're saying, you try things because as a, a new educator, your focus is on the repertoire or achieving some kind of uh, technical achievement goal, not on. See, but, and that's the issue because that's what you were, uh, or I should say, I'm trying not to be condemning, like I said, yeah. but it bothers me because that's what you were taught to focus on. I think mm -hmm. that to me is the philosophical issue is if you went through this program and you were trained to say, what is most important to me is to make sure that you land this, you know, fingering in tune We're we're looking too small. I mean, we're, we're really focusing on something that's too narrow. And I want to stress for those that are interested um, this was a turning point for me in grad school. I was very grateful. I had a professor that introduced me to a book. It's it's a dense read, but for anyone that's that's interested in doing it, I highly recommend it. It's called The Ignorant Schoolmaster by Jacques Rancière. Um, I'll put a link up here in a second to it. And one of the, you know, spoiler alert, one of the big things that he points out, he he chronicles the the work of an educator named Joseph Jean question that an educator can ask that man can ask is what do you think yeah. he says this is the, every educator should be asking this question he said because the goal is the whole point that he makes of saying the ignorant schoolmaster is that we perpetuate this very old european model of you know the the explicator in the front that explains everything and has all the answers and you're not supposed to talk and understand anything until I give you the understanding. Uh, Paulo Friede talks about it as the banking model of education where educators are just there to deposit information into students. There's all of these examples of this. But what's so liberating about Ranciere's work is he says, we have to start asking our students, what do you think? Because the point is that you're empowering them. You're giving them agency to create their realities. And it's not about, and this, this is something that I even changed for those that think, well, what does that have to do with, you know, string pedagogy or music ed? Everything. I, <laughs> I realized for years I would, I just write this is how you need to do it. And I never gave them time to say, well, let's try it in second position. And then what think? I hated the string crossings. Great. Well, just tell us the fingering, Mr. Hansen. No, I want you to learn. That's the point. I don't want to dictate how you play this piece and when you play this piece. I want you to understand that the skills I'm giving you are, are there to explore. There isn't one way of fingering it. And there's not one way of doing it. And I don't want to just supply those answers. So the fact that you, know, you have that experience, I'm so grateful for because to say like wow third period was rough wasn't it yeah how do i make it better well what do you think because <laughs> you're going to be teaching the way that i teach but you're not the same educator as i am i will say that was a frustrating way to learn but of i'm course. i'm grateful that it happened uh to take kind of what you were talking about and look at it from the meta perspective is when we are born we are all uh, sent into somebody training is everybody in our world is trying to teach us how to be somebody. And then maybe someday when we grow up, uh, some person will look at us and say, geez, you're really somebody. But 
what that that doesn't really help us anymore. I think the better question is, how do you serve? How do I serve? And and ask that question of our of our students, especially if if you are someone who is in charge of training educators, is asking them, how do you serve? You know, what, what is the way that you serve your world around you? And this goes so much farther outside of music is just in any interaction with a student to, to bring it back to music, that how was I serving this student in this interaction when I was asking them to play in second position? How was I serving them? And, and just really investigate that because there, there might be a situation where uh, they just it didn't occur to them to play it in second position and it would be beneficial to them to experience second position for the first time. So that would be, you you're serving them well in that scenario. Uh, But if you were this um, competitive person who's just thinking about performance goals uh, and you ask yourself, how do I serve? Well, I I think uh, sort of a blanket answer is you serve not everybody is how you serve. You serve the couple of people who are willing to work hard, whether it's you or somebody else, as long as they're the taskmaster. That's how you serve, is not everybody. And whatever our individual philosophy is, or however we were trained, or however we're training future educators, we need to be able to say that we're going to serve the whole room. Sorry, I'm going to balance my my mute button. Oh, there you go. And I love the fact that you're employing this verb to serve because, again, I don't think it's also. I mean, and I think this is worth bringing into the conversation at this point. And we hinted at it earlier. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to contextualize my role as an orchestra director at SPU is, and I and I struggle with this. I'm putting myself out there to be honest. The, this like mystique, you know, of the, the ensemble director or, oh my goodness, you're a university professor. I have, I have struggled to make sure that in social engagement that I try to introduce to people, you know, oh, what do you do? I'm a teacher. Mm-hmm. I, I don't, you know, I am, I am proud of the things I've accomplished and I'm so blessed to be able to serve at a university and teach future educators. But I, I struggle with this sort of social mantle of like, well, I'm a university faculty member. And so that means something. No, I don't want to lose being a teacher because that's really my job is to still be a teacher. And wherever you're teaching, um, my, my mother actually had this sort of rude awakening when I got this job and forgive me, I'm being, I know that this is somewhat crass uh, to talk about this publicly, but people that know me know that I really don't have any secrets. Um, my mother was excited for me. She knew I was applying for these jobs and she was so excited uh, my mother doesn't have any sort of background in education or anything like that. So just total novice to sort of the structures of education. And when I started teaching, I was teaching middle school orchestra. And then I turned that into a middle school high school position. I was teaching part-time at both. And then I was full-time at high school. So I had this sort of maturation. And my mother had always assumed that elementary school teachers teach elementary school for a certain amount of time. And then they get promoted to middle school. And then they get promoted to high school. And if you do the job right, you can get promoted into teaching at a university. And so when I was applying, she's like, oh, wow. Like in her mind, I like met the qualifications because I had taught high school long enough. And so she goes, well, this must be really exciting for you because this is, I think she even said like, this is a big promotion. Um, And aren't you excited about that? And I was like, well, no, I mean, I'm just, I'm going to be teaching different things. You know, I'm, I'm teaching different people. I'm teaching a different age group and cognitively they operate differently. I'm teaching some different subjects because I'm no longer teaching, you know, orchestra. I'm teaching how to teach orchestra. Like, you know, it's this inception thing of like, now so I'm teaching how to teach the thing. The how, how do I serve question? How do I best serve? Well, and it's but it's interesting because that that misconception creates those social stigmas. Um, and I said that this is is somewhat crass because one of the big conversations I had to have with my mother is she was like, "Well, I'm so happy for you, and you're finally going to get paid what you're worth." And I had to explain to her, college faculty members don't make a lot of money. If you're tenured and you've been in an institution for a long time, you can get there. 
But, and this, and I've told a lot of people this, and forgive me again, this isn't a judgment thing. This is about realities. I, I really try to push that people. I, I took a teaching full time as a high school orchestra director because I had stipends that came with my position. I was overseeing the vertical alignment, the fifth grade strings program, and the middle schools. I had a vast number of responsibilities, and I had built up in my years of service. We had a, a pay increase for every year that we served in our district. So I had built my salary up in the district that I was serving at. Then when I took a new position as a first year tenure track assistant professor, I started back at the bottom of the totem pole. I took a pay cut, and my family could not process it. They said, well, that doesn't make any sense. You're a college professor. Clearly, you make more money than a public school teacher. And I was like, no, I am a teacher. And in general, in America and particularly, we struggle culturally and socially to respect education in general. That's a, another teacher talk. And to a further but, point, what our elementary strings teachers are doing Oh. is just as, if not more important than what's happening at the college level. Please because talk not, about it. You're not going to have anybody who comes up to the middle school to play that comes up. It's only attrition from the beginning all the way up until we get people who want to be music educators. You know, when we in Port Angeles, when we start with, you know, a vast majority of all fourth graders do strings, that number isn't going to go up by the time yeah. they get to high school. You know, and, and we've we've got to find a way to retain as much as possible. Yes. But but not focus on that in a way that I'm going to bend over backwards to keep every kid, because there are people who if we ask ourselves, uh, how do I serve and how do I best serve and how do you best serve yourself and your community? Is there are some people who are meant to be in band? And that's yes. fine. And there are people who are meant to be in choir. And there are people like me who are meant to be in choir and orchestra. And, and there are people who are not meant to be in, in orchestra. And there are people who are not meant to be teachers. And if and this is a, a philosophy of mine. If you get to the end of high school and no one has asked you what you want to do with your life, we have all failed you. Mm. Because if you get to college and you're wasting, you know, $50,000 worth of, you know, debt or mommy and daddy's money, and you don't know what you want to do yet, because nobody asked you that, how do I serve question? You know, that, that, that hurts me. And so a big part of my education is through music and through performance and, and the unique way that a music class allows you to make a connection with a student in a way that just for whatever reason, doesn't seem to happen in the math mm -hmm. class. Uh, ask kids that question it just in those little passing moments that happen. And, and and I work with my seating arrangements in such a way that that I get an opportunity to talk with every student you know, as frequently as possible and just ask that question of, you know, what interests you? What, what gives you fulfillment? Yes. So that when they're asked that question of how do you want to serve your community after high school, maybe they have an answer. But uh, I, I totally went off on a tangent there, but getting back to it is something that my predecessor, James Ray, said is that you cannot see the high school position as more important than the middle school or the elementary Absolutely. School. You Absolutely. You cannot look at it that way. Because uh, as, as I pointed out, it, it's only attrition from that point up. And so it's if you have dwindling numbers from freshman to senior year, you can't blame the elementary teachers for not sending you enough kids. Yep. You know, if you got a, a hole in the bucket, you, you deal with that and patch the hole and, and, and find a way to, to work it out. But uh, college professors and, and high school music teachers, we really need to look at our, our feeders as as equals if not betters because the work that they're doing in many ways is more challenging because they're dealing at, at high school i i only have the kids who want to be an orchestra exactly but they have made a choice they have committed and they did that they made that same choice in middle school and high school they doubled down uh the elementary people they got kids who just showed up well I don't know, that might be fun or the parents want them to be there exactly yeah, it, it, that's a whole different conversation. Is mm. the parent who forced the kid to be there? Is how do you speak to their spirit and and get them 
to feel empowered by music, even if they don't feel empowered by the instrument their parents forced them to learn. Well, and I wanted to, to before we leave for today, I can't believe an hour's already passed. Um, I wanted to return to that. Yeah, can you believe it? It's, it's amazing. Um, <laughs> thank you to Joe Divig. A shout out to one of our colleagues up here in Washington. He had made a comment my about... Nice teacher. Yeah, that, oh, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, so he, he made a comment about a conversation on programming, and I wanted to make this connection so people won't think that I'm just being petty and bringing up salaries. I bring it up only to talk to the idea of this commodification of, of education or of just things in general in culture and society, that the perceptions of importance are tied to this monetary value or the larger numbers, you know, uh, teachers that have bigger programs are more successful, right? Uh, teachers that are, are winning more contests or playing more music are somehow more successful. Um, that, that educators that make more money, uh, depending on the district or state that you're in or the level that you're teaching, that that makes a difference. The size of the school and the institution. Well, if you're teaching at a university and you're working with more students up there, then you're more successful than the elementary school teacher. That commodification and that valuing, I think, is where we see the greatest issues, systemic issues, mm -hmm. is that there is no, and I, and it, and I struggle with it because I. I feel, again, blessed to serve in the position that I do, and I do believe that I've earned it. I've, I've worked hard to be able to teach at the college level, but at the same time, that doesn't separate me from my elementary school colleague. It doesn't mean that I know more or less. It has nothing to do with the value of us as educators. We teach in different places. And so when I engage with people, and it's this, again, this like weird perceived, like, oh, well, Professor Hansen, because you have that title, you must know this. Like, no, it, it doesn't mean anything other than the fact that I teach at this school. The mm -hmm. same way that I, I always, I, I've never understood this. This is such a cultural thing. Uh, and maybe it was just in Texas, but I've, I've met people that do this. Like at the daycares or at the, the Bible school or even in a lot of the elementary schools, you know, like I'm Mr. Chris. But then when you get to middle school, I'm Mr. Hansen. But if I'm in college, it's Professor Hansen. That there's these titles, you know, that in elementary school, so many of the educators and staff members will go by, like, their first name. And the, these weird little things that we do to try to devalue whatever grade you're teaching or what level you're teaching at, when we pull back, and this is hopefully to go full circle in this conversation to where you started this, Nathan, of that, of having the service mentality and teaching the people in front of you and humbling yourself to know this isn't about my goals. This is about how I can lead people with the skill set that I have as an educator to a better place than they were than when we started. Well, and, and that, I, I just want to put a bow on it. Of I, I went over the comments and I, I read Joe's little comment is especially with the younger educators with the repertoire. And, and I am definitely guilty of having made repertoire mistakes many times. Uh, Same. Is we, if you meet the student where they are and be realistic with where that is, they're going to be more successful. And this is something that, that I, I think I quoted James on once already, but not so eloquently, is that if, if you give the students an achievable goal, you can have high expectations. If the goal oh, is wow. yeah. So if you give a, a student or a, you know, a, an, a young educator in training, a realistic goal of something that it, you know, it's a slam dunk, it's going to happen, then you can hold them to these high expectations that uh, the people at the competitive level hold their students to. But you've got to set that achievable goal first. And when we're looking at ourselves and what this next school year is going to look like, I think we, we need to, to some degree, apply that to ourselves and to our students of what can we reasonably achieve and do reasonably well? And what am I reasonably able to do and set up for my students curriculum wise and have a little bit of grace with myself of how much am I actually going to be able to achieve and determine what I'm going to do and then hold myself to the highest possible expectation once I've determined what I'm actually capable of doing. And it's so powerful the way you've articulated it where we're again sort of folding back onto a previous point of that's where I believe we need to focus as educators is the sequencing and the scaffolding and the curriculum development. 
because exactly as you said, and I'm so glad that you know James shares the same sentiment. He's been on Teacher Talk twice now. I, I love being able to connect with him. Is it's it's about because most people I think would hear that and assume they're lowering their standards, and that's not it at all. You are you're creating a goal because then you create the standards that allow you to go even further. Um, and whether you call it, you know, Stephen Kobe calls it begin with the end in mind, or there's all of these great, you know, kind of kitschy ways of looking at it. But if you're looking at this end result, here's what I want my students to accomplish for these intrinsic, for these intrinsic benefits. How can I reverse engineer it? How can I get back to the beginning to say, then we're going to need to start here and be flexible in how we develop this year. And, and to, uh, this is in no way to have the last word, but I, I want to reiterate, I think, the, the title that I gave somewhat sporadically to this conversation to start us off was, you know, seeing possibility as success. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's exactly what you're describing in this year is that you're going to try things. And the fact that you're trying something has already set you apart. You're not giving up. You're not saying it's not possible. You're going to make music this year, whatever that looks like for you. And it should look different on every campus and for every grade level. And we need to be, in general, I think we should all be encouraging each other more and be celebrating each other more. Not, oh, well, you didn't do a virtual ensemble. Well, then you weren't really successful. Oh, you didn't have your kids meet in person in some way. Well, then you weren't really successful. Oh, you. We need well, to stop creating standards out of it. All eight hundred Port Angeles Orchestra students, they're welcome to do that, right? You know, <laughs> but it's it, we need to stop creating standards out of the experiments. And I want to say that again: we don't create standards out of experiments. It defies the definition of an experiment. We're trying things so that we can create new opportunities. And that is success in, in this year. I think and, that is success. And not everything we try is going to be a success. Exactly. As long as we are open with the reflection of why did this not work, like Paula Ferguson did with me, is why do you think that didn't work? Yes. And, and be vulnerable with, our, with the families we serve and the students we serve of Hey guys, it looks like those of you who engaged didn't like this very much. What can we do next time? What have we done so far that that worked well for you? And an engagement may or may not reflect actual student fulfillment. And you know, whatever measures you're using to assess students will reflect that to to some degree. Uh, but allowing yourself to to have a couple of failures this year so that you can reach the kids in the way that they need to be reached. So don't have, like you're saying, don't think that you have to do a vir virtual performance. It doesn't work out because the kids couldn't follow the metronome and then feel like now we're not going to do anything the rest of the year is okay. Well, that didn't work. Why didn't it work? And what about the way that it didn't work might tell me what will work. So the kids can send me videos. Exactly. Yeah. Does work. Or maybe if they can't do videos, maybe they can send you audio. It would be really easy to give the kids little tiny assignments of, hey, play measure 12 through 18, just like, you know, a couple of measures and send that to me. And uh, and if it's just short little snippets, no matter how many kids I have, I can actually give you some pretty directed, yeah. specific feedback that I wouldn't have had time for in the classroom. And, you know, it's about, I think it is, it's a paradigm shift. I think no one can argue that we're going through this paradigm shift together. But a part of it is getting rid of, you know, the F word, failure. We need to stop seeing it as, well, I didn't do this thing that I created an expectation of, and so then I have failed. I, I love that you say that. It's not about identifying failures. It's about identifying what works for us and then what doesn't work. You know, we're pulling on that old Edison quote, right? It's not about just defeating ourselves and saying that we didn't accomplish whatever this goal is that you set out for yourself. If you didn't create the light bulb, you didn't fail. You just found a new way not to create the light bulb. If anything good came out of The Last Jedi, which I think generally was a not very good movie, <laughs> is the quote from Yoda is that the greatest teacher failure is. I love it. You know what? There's not a better way to end a teacher talk than a Yoda quote. I stand by that. Um, <laughs> I want I want to respect your time, and I genuinely actually need to go find my son because things are too quiet over here. Um, but Nathan, I can't thank you enough. This will definitely not be the last time that we talk, but I hope that I can bring you to this platform again. 
because this has been so rewarding. Thank you so much for your time. And for, for people that are watching, this is going to be archived on our YouTube playlist. And I want to do a shameless plug, something that uh, Nathan has been involved with, as well as Joe Divig, who provided some comments today. Uh, so we have created what we're calling the Washington Orchestra Network, which is affiliated with our Washington Music Educators Association. And I'm working on some platforms to be able to share some resources and to celebrate the success that Washington Music Educators are having, particularly orchestra teachers and string teachers, uh, that they're just trying some things and they're working for them we're going to have a platform available we've got a social media page through facebook and then i've created a google drive so that we'll be able to share some documents so keep your eyes peeled for those of you that are in washington state and even those of you that are not necessarily on washington you can still like and follow that page but this is for washington educators that are trying some things out and have found some success we're going to be sharing those resources for you and we hope that you'd engage in that platform Talk to us about what's working for you and share the success. Let us know what is working for you so that we can try it ourselves, so that we can reorient what it is that we're doing and how we envision our success with our students. So thank you for everybody that watched today and those of you that might be looking at the archived video. Please stay plugged in. Continue to have conversations and dialogue with your colleagues. Uh, tune in next week for Teacher Talk. I'll be having another conversation with an educator, an artist, and talking about more success that we can experiment with and that we can find in these possibilities that exist in this unique time. I hope you have a great Sunday. We look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks so much.